particular spread reads about Alexandra. 15 years old, she was born in London, lives in London, and feels like she'll probably die in London. It's <laughs> <laughs> really nice. It's a very kind of teenage so, comment. Yeah. How did this shoot come about? Um, well, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but my the editor at that time was Beatrix Miller, and she was a wonderful editor. I had edited Vogue for, I think, 24 years, actually. It came in the 60s from um, Queen magazine. Anyway, she'd worked on Queen with my mum, and so they were friends, and so I had met Beatrix, and I think they were looking for a teenager to do, as you can see, a before and um, after shoot. And that was me, yeah. So in the um, the reflection, I'm standing in the window of Browns oh, yeah. in South Moulton Street. And I was having my hair done at Moulton Brown, which was across uh -huh. the road. And I always thought that actually I looked better before than after <laughs> in that shoot. Um, but I so remember that smock that I'm wearing in the picture at the top. You can't see it. It says it was that a lovely as little well. It actually says, um, Does it say she, spends her, she spends her money on records and clothes that don't cling. <laughs> Very long skirts and smocks. Right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, probably be what I'll be wearing post-June as well. <laughs> <laughs> Just one big tracksuit. Um, so that's it. I think now we can take some questions sure. from the audience, if that's okay. Yep. Yeah. Perfect timing. So, is there anything anybody here would like to ask? Okay, Alexandra? so we've got the question over there. Now, you... You can shout. You can shout. We have repeated. massive ears. I'm interested really, uh, Alexandra, in uh, what influences your style, who influences it, and what things you take into consideration when you're actually addressing... For myself? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, who influences my style, and... Um, what do I think about when I'm dressing for, I guess, for the public? Um, well, I think everybody, uh, nothing really influences my style. Any, Well, everybody's influenced by something or other, but I wouldn't say that I'm particularly influenced by sort of magazines, for instance, which is weird. <laughs> um, but I think that one of the things I'm really interested in in fashion is why we wear what we wear, you know, what decisions you make, why people dress the way they dress. So I think, you know, we will all both have thought about what we were wearing today, for instance. And, I mean, I, I knew that I wanted to wear something that was kind of optimistic, uh, hence the pink. Um, also, it's new. I uh, want a chance to wear my new Bella Freud jacket. Um, and I wanted to kind of... I didn't want to... Yeah, so that was the starting point for what I wanted to wear my new pink jacket and I wanted to wear something optimistic because I've sort of broken the news of a, um, of a change. So I guess... But... But that will be true. There'll always be something. There'll be something to do with the day. I mean, I don't know why you've chosen to wear that Burberry shirt, for instance. Um, no, uh, uh, I don't... I never know. It's so weird. I spent my whole life thinking about clothes, and then I never know... Why? What I, why? <laughs> I, can, I never get to the bottom of it. I think that's why I'm still interested in them. Like, I mean, we, um, we... I think I like to feel... I think this is quite scary to stand in front of people and ask you questions. So I thought maybe when I am intimidated, I wear heels and I try and dress like right. a boy. So that's probably the formula. <laughs> I'm like, I'm strong and I'm adamant right. at the same time. Perfect. Stand and Perfect deliver. Perfect combo. <laughs> um, another question. Over here. Hi. Uh, um, who do you think, uh, can you see a man taking over your role as editor of Folk? Yeah, definitely. Um, and who would you...? Oh, I mean, I'm not saying it will be a man, but I could absolutely imagine it being a man. I mean, um, Emanuele 
has just taken over, um, sadly, uh, Franco Sozzani's role in Italy. Um, or anyway, the not entirely her role, but editing Italian Vogue. And uh, there are a lot of men, male editors in fashion magazines. So I can, I can completely see a man doing it. Yeah, I don't think there'd be any problem with that. And it would be very difficult for me to say that I did think it, because I was made editor of GQ um, just after it launched, so it wouldn't really become me to think that a man couldn't do it. Any more cues? We have some A's. How do you compare um, American Vogue and British Vogue? Compare and contrast. Um, um, how, how do I compare American Vogue with British Vogue? Well, America, it's a, in some ways we have, you know, the core is the same, the subject matter is the same, but uh, America has a totally different model, for instance. Uh, it's a subscription model, whereas uh, most of my magazine is sold on the newsstand, so you're arguing with every other magazine on the newsstand for 75% of our circulation, whereas um, American Vogue, you buy a subscription and you get it every year, which kind of changes the dynamic of what you're trying to do with it. My magazine has to, in a way, I think, speak more directly to the, to the potential buyer. Um, but Anna's magazine has to um, appeal to a much bigger marketplace than, than British Vogue. And I think to that end, probably um, has an element that's more mainstream that we're able to be a bit more idiosyncratic and kind of quirky, British, eccentric. Um, so I think those are the main differences. But you know, we're, we're not that different as my concerns. Can I ask you what, you what you'll miss about being the editor yeah. of British Vogue? Um, I will miss my staff. I really will miss them. Um, I mean, I'll miss particular individuals, but I will also miss the thing of walking into an office and coming in and just knowing that you're working by walking in through the front door and having all these people that, you know, I really know how to work with, I really know how to collaborate with, and I think that kind of security um, I will miss hugely. And um, odd things like John, who's down in reception, you know, who's so friendly and always says good morning every morning, and Tony the Hatch, who makes the coffee and things, you know, I'm definitely going to miss them. And, and what are you most proud of? Um, Over 25 years. Oh, I can't. I, I can't answer that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions from the audience? The loads of them. Yeah. Uh, which one? Actually, what are your dreams for the next three years? I'm really intrigued. Oh, uh, I'm not your sure I can answer. Too ideas. soon, too soon. <laughs> my dreams for the next three years. Well, I mean, um, well, one dream is just to sort of keep myself and my family and everything. It's quite nerve-wracking to, you know, jump out of a salary job um, and know what you're doing into the wide blue yonder. So um, I'm already going around the house telling everyone to switch the lights off in rooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already so we're looking at the Ocado order and seeing what's not necessary here. <laughs> um, but on a more kind of um, optimistic note, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing time in a different way, to, to not necessarily sort of see a Monday morning like a Monday morning. Or I'm intrigued to know what a weekend will feel like when you haven't necessarily had a whole working week that's the same. So I'm really interested to see what the shape of life will be like. Um, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I certainly write. I want to do more writing. That time thing's quite interesting as well, because I suppose if you're editing a magazine, you're always living in the future. Yeah, 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 exactly. Does that disrupt how you view Yeah, I think it um, would be really nice to live a bit more... When people talk about living in the moment and mindfulness, but actually I realise I'm really bad about that, and I don't think it's very helpful if you're always working three months ahead, you know, you're thinking about Christmas in June, and I think it will be rather wonderful to actually just be thinking about today, but maybe it won't work out like that, I don't know. 
Um, okay, I think there are more questions over this area. Uh, how we'll about the, the corner? Hello. Um, did everyone hear that question? Um, I think, you know, when you leave, you leave, and you have to be prepared that um, whatever you've done will get changed, and, you know, people talk about a kind of legacy, but I'm not really a great kind of believer in legacies. I think you just, uh, you know, you do it while you do it, and then you move away and what becomes important is the new person doing it. So I um, I feel quite prepared for that and quite sanguine about it. And I know that from other jobs that I've done, when I left, I didn't really feel any kind of ownership of it in the past. I, I think you do, you do sort of move on. And, and the waters close over you really, really quickly. You know, you just... You can't expect that people will in any way revere what you've built up. I mean, what I would hope is that the really talented brother takes over and we'll have a good relationship. I'm sure that they'll do different things and it'll be in different ways. Okay, should we do another question? Hello. Do you think that you decided, I guess really, when did you decide that this would be? your last year? Did you decide before... Yeah, yeah, no, I Which page I, number of this book did you give up? I'm just trying to think, and you've done this for such a long time. Why didn't I decide sooner, you mean? <laughs> Not at all. Um, no, I know exactly when I decided. I decided in um, November. And um, I had thought about it for two or three years, and then once the centenary was going to happen and it was underway. I mean, no way was I going to miss out on that, you know, whole thing. That was going to be amazing. And even when uh, I saw the television documentary that was done and Richard, the director, decided to make a sort of part of the plot about whether I was going to resign or not based on nothing at all. I can't, you know, reason the best known to himself. Um, I didn't particularly think I was going to leave then, but I suddenly did think in November that I just mm. just suddenly decided that um, that I felt happy about the idea of leaving, whereas before I'd always felt miserable and panicked, and um, suddenly I didn't, and it just seemed exciting. So, but it's weird. I mean, I think that happens, you know, with big decisions in life. You do suddenly suddenly you see the way to, to pass through. Should we do one more question? Right at the back there. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm just going to ask, do you think achieving a typically sort of British aesthetic has influenced your ideas for the magazine? And is that something you've always had to sort of keep in mind? Sure. Um, sort of yes and no. I don't, I, I, I don't feel it at all... British myself, and I'm not even particularly interested in the notion of Britishness, but I think that I've, uh, having lived here all my life, and all my influences, and most of my kind of cultural influences do come from here, that that kind of um, British diversity and lack of uniformity is something that is just part of the way that I think about culture and and was always something I wanted to bring to the magazine. So it had been like that anyway. Um, Beatrix's um, issues were incredibly diverse. They had no kind of uniformity. And that, in fact, my predecessor, Liz Tilberis, was probably the one that had the most kind of um, singular aesthetic. And I think that's because she was a fashion editor. Um, whereas if you're a fashion editor yourself, I think you tend to want to have the imagery, something that you would have styled, but Beatrix wasn't a fashion editor, and I've never been a fashion editor, so I was far more interested in kind of curating elements of other people's work and 
And I think that has made it quite a kind of rich and interesting mix. Whereas if you look at, say, French Vogue has got, you know, it's very, very much the the vision of um, Emmanuel, who does it now, and Karine before her, who styled a lot of the shoots. Anna has a very, very strict sort of view of how she feels an image should be in her magazine. Um, but I just don't have that. It's it's more like, well, I'll take a bit of this and a bit of that, and we'll make a kind of mush of it. Do you have anyone left that you'd like to meet that you're hoping to squeeze in these next two months? Um, do you know what? I don't really like meeting the people I think I'd like to meet. Um, it's always, it's always rather nerve-wracking, and you never, you never have the conversation that you think you're going to have. Yeah. So I think I'd rather leave them as dreams. I mean, Leonard Cohen, I would have wanted to meet. Mm. Well, I've missed the opportunity now. Yeah, dreamy dreams. Mm. Okay, well, I think we'll end it there. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank, Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Cheers.